Welcome back to the Swim Swim Breakdown. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you from Austin, Texas, joined by Yin Yin Lee from Madison, New Jersey. Yin Yin, thanks for coming by. I'm not even going to ask you an intro question today because we've got a lot of swimming to cover. Yep. First off, women's NC2As is upon us. It starts tomorrow, actually, on yeah, Wednesday tomorrow. night. Uh, and we're going to we're gonna preview it for you right now. So we are going to start with what we think is absolutely going to happen, transition to what we think might happen, and then end our little women's NC preview with some hot takes of things we think could happen, but but maybe won't. Uh, so first off, Yin Yin, just give me your <clears throat> absolutely, we are going to see this at the women's NC2A championships in Athens, Georgia. Well, we talked about this a little bit off camera, but I personally think both of the Walsh sisters are going to be breaking U.S. Open records at this meet. Gretchen Walsh is a pretty obvious one because she's been doing that all season and she's bound to have an all-time meet this weekend. But Alex Walsh, she really feels like she could be on the verge of something special this year. People said she had a quote-unquote off meet last year when she went she barely went personal best in um, her I, I am events and didn't win the 200 fly. But this year she just has been performing at a ridiculous. Oh, okay. I'm not saying last year was an off me. It just wasn't as ridiculous as Kate Douglas is me or um, Gretchen Walsh is me. But Alex Walsh, she's just, she had a monster ACCs broke 21 in the, 50 free on relay went 202 in the 200 breast yeah. 149 one in the 200 fly new nca record 151 in 200 im just overall across the board really really impressive times from a conference perspective and honestly like even stronger than what she did at ncas in my opinion for a lot of these events and she's just i just think she's ready to take that next step and really just become a level higher. So I, I could see her, I could see her maybe taking down, I could see her maybe taking down Easton's record or knocking down, knocking on the door of Kate Douglas' records in 200 IM 200 breast. Definitely a tall task, but I think she'll get there in at least one event. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, I think Alex Walsh, yeah. One NC 2A record or US Open record for her. I think that's 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 a good call. I think uh, her sister Gretchen, we're going to see NC two A records from her. I think her sweeping Gretchen Walsh sweeping her individual events in the fifty free, hundred free, and hundred fly. It's absolutely going to happen. No one is anywhere close to her in those events. She is the top seed in the hundred fly by over two seconds, which is just like unfathomable to me. Yeah, especially without the competition of Catherine Burkoff in her event in the 100 back, which she had in past years. There's really nothing stopping her. I don't think there's any competition that's like legitimately close to what she's been putting up this year. There's no way she loses any of her races. Yeah, barring disaster uh, or health issue, you know, barring something pretty catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Um, Gre Gretchen's going three for three. You mentioned Catherine Burkoff too. Mm -hmm. Catherine Burkoff, barring disaster, Catherine Burkoff mm -hmm. is winning a third NC2A yep. title in the 100 backstroke because she is, I think, nearly two seconds or a second and a half ahead of the number two seed in the 100 backstroke without Gretchen Walsh swimming it individually. So I, I think that that is a given that she will be taking back her crown in her last year of NC2A competition as well. Yeah. I don't think yeah, there's anything to solve her. Anything the equivalent of Gretchen Walsh losing any of her races or Catherine Burkoff losing the 100 back would be like a 16 seed upsetting a one seed in March Madness. Yeah. I maybe even maybe even more upsetting, but Yeah, maybe even more <laughs> than that cuz <clears throat> Um, agreed. Other surefire things that w we will see at this NC two A's. Bella Sims wins an NC two A title. Oh well, yeah, that's definitely surefire. But if we want to transition that into maybe, I think mm -hmm. Bella Sims goes a personal best time would be a maybe. Just because so I think 
even without going a personal best, I think she can still win the 500 free and potentially the 200 free as well. But, oh wait, who is also in... Okay, her biggest competition is probably going to be Izzy Ivy in the 200 free. But mm -hmm. she's already been 140 this year, has a pretty decent, I think, 432 in the 500 free. And... 149 in the 200 back and i just think i think this might just be because of how florida operates they are always so lights out at secs i think if there was a time for her to set a personal best it would be during secs and i don't think during ncaa's but i'm not completely ruling it out just because bella sims has been been pretty good and she's probably a top three swimmer in the NCA right now, but I, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm just not fully certain, especially since her personal best coming out of high school were already really fast. Yeah. So to give listeners context, her best times, Oh, the lifetime bests in the, her three NC two a events, 200 free one forty point seven, five hundred 500 free 428.6 and 200 back 148.3. Her, the times that she has gone this season, her seeds at the NC two A is all number one seeds. And the two hundred, uh, let's two hundred backstroke. She's been one forty nine zero. Two hundred free. She's been one forty point nine. And five hundred free. She's been four thirty two point five. So I agree with you. Florida's always lights out at SECs, and Bella. I don't think she has to go best times to win these events. Um, but especially in those 200s, it seems like sh she has already gotten very close. And so it seems very likely, but I'm with you that it's it's not guaranteed she's going a lifetime best at this meet. Yeah, and Good I chance think, of it though. Yeah, and I think if there were any event to do it in, it would probably be the 200 back because that's where her time isn't ridiculously ahead of everyone else's. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she's a surefire favorite in the 200 back either. Agreed. Yeah. Especially with Isabel Stodden yeah, looming from Cal. <clears throat> um, she has yet to win an NC2A title in her patented tuner backstroke. And so I, th I think she will be hungry for that and, and charging for Bella um, who, I mean, Stodden has a great back half and Bella is kind of known as a front half swimmer especially in, in yards events. Um, another maybe, I'm going to go now to the team battle at women's NC2As. Tennessee gets on the podium. They get a top four finish. Uh, they get a, a team trophy, um, which are awarded to the top four teams at women's NC2As. Currently, they are seated to finish fourth, if you score out the psych sheet, uh, behind Virginia, Texas, and Florida. They are about 70 points behind Florida and about 80 points ahead of fifth place USC. So yeah, I think there's a decent chance that this happens just because, so they're projected to score 366.5 points and, oh no, they're projected to score 294 mm -hmm. points um, in fourth and SoCal is expected to score 213.5 points and they're tied with Stanford in that regard and all three of these teams have historically maybe not performed as well at NCAAs compared to the start of the season so if all three teams go move down then I think Tennessee still can stay in front and they've also gotten better at holding their taper which we saw that last year and we didn't see that from usc and stanford so i expect a little more from them than i have in past season so i think it's it's not unreasonable to predict them to finish fourth but definitely not a guarantee yeah i think if if all three of those teams can bring it to nc two a's that's tennessee usc and stanford um, I think Tennessee has a little bit more depth than SC and Stanford do. Um, the, the two California teams have a, a lot of really good top end talent, but I think Tennessee just goes a little deeper and that's represented in the psych sheets. 
Um, so I think if anything, Stanford might be able to displace Tennessee for that fourth and final team trophy. But uh, as of now, I think Tennessee can hold, hold their seed. Um, and it would be really cool to see them get that fourth place trophy. Yeah. Uh, I, now I'm going to transition to my hot take, which I'm very excited for. And that is that I think we will see a female swimmer go 55 in the hundred yard breaststroke. Now the top Ooh. seed is Mona McSherry at 56, eight. And I don't think any swimmer in the field has a personal best. That's faster than 56, eight, but there is like, there's so much talent in this field. I'm going to just going to read the top seven seeds, Mona McSherry, Caitlin Dobler, Jasmine Nocentini, Lydia Jacoby, Anna Ellen, Hannah Bach, Avery Wiseman. I mean, all of these women are just sensational breaststrokers and there's so much speed in this pack that I last year, it was just a dog fight to get, to get to the wall. And Lydia Jacoby ended up winning the NC2A title in this hundred breast is a freshman at 57 two. I think this year someone's going to separate. I think, and I think there's like five women who could do that. You know, I think Mona McSherry could have a, a meet Dobler, Nocentini, Jacoby. I like I, out of those four women, I think one of them is just going to hit the gas, not look back 55, nine. I'm not saying Lily King's NC2A records going down, but I think we're going to see a 55. You see, my thing is that I think the 100 breast is definitely the most competitive event of the meet, and I feel like it has been for the past three years more so now because a lot of these other events are kind of just straight chalk. <laughs> They're like straight chalk. Heavy favorite. Yeah. Um. But I don't. I don't think competitive equals fast because I think all these swimmers are going to be pushing each other and it's going to be more about the race than the someone trying to go a certain time unless they all are ridiculous and push each other to you personal best but I think at most we'll see like a 56.5 I don't think 55.9 and expecting someone to drop one second is in a 100 is reasonable because there aren't any swimmers in this field that I'm that are like historically known to drop ridiculous time from conferences to NC NCAs. I would have said Jasmine Nocentini because she's from Virginia. If this wasn't her first NCAs in three years, I think there's that hurdle she has to get over for first. But there there is isn't a swimmer in this field that I think will make a massive leap this year. So I'm going to say I disagree, but my hot take is that I think Gretchen Walsh gets left off the 400 free relay and Ooh. will swim both the 400 medley and the 800 free relay because I think UVA is gunning for both for the NCAA record in the 800 free relay and they need Gretchen Walsh on their relay to do that. And they don't really, I don't think they need Walsh to break the 400 free relay NCAA record because they already have a very strong contingent in that relay of Alex in that event. There's Alex Walsh, Jasmine Lucentini, 46 7 flat start, best time. Amy Canny's been 47 low. Um, Maxine Parker's been 47 low, I believe, as well. So they have a strong core of swimmers that they don't need a Gretchen Walsh to pull them. When we talked it. about this off camera, you said to, I thought we, I thought we were saying to win the event. I don't think they're going to break the NC2A record in the Florida free relay without Gretchen. That would be a tall order. You have to average 40. Uh, six, forty-six, fives or something. Oh uh, no, no, I meant the eight hundred free relay. Like they want to NCA record, they want the title in the eight hundred free relay. I don't think they're not going to get it in the four hundred free relay without. Okay, Walsh. you said break the NC two A record in the four hundred free relay. 
Oh, okay. I meant 800s. <laughs> all right, just so we're on the same page. But you think okay. they're going to win all five relays and br- and go for the NC2A record in the 800 free relay. Therefore, I'm not leaving- saying they're going to I'm not I'm not saying they're going to break it. I think they're, they're going to try for to it. go for it. Uh yeah. therefore leaving Gretchen Walsh off the 400 free relay. I did yeah. think that was a hot take, but when you break it down, it does make sense. Uh because like you said, UVA has the depth, especially on the last day to, I think, win the 400 free relay uh, without Gretchen Walsh, which is insane. But also, mm-hmm. they I, I doubt that on the last day they will need to win the 400 free relay. But yeah. d- can you imagine a scenario where they would need to <laughs> and they don't have Gretchen Walsh? I mean, again, I, I still think they can, but that would be intense. <laughs> That would be intense, but they're also going to win anyway. Yeah. So they're going to win. Do you think they'll get the NC two A record in the eight hundred free relay? They were like four tenths away at conference. I mean, they were not very far in an eight hundred four tenths. I think they're going to get it because the, I don't think they're going to have. They might have another opportunity to do this, but like. When you have opportunities like this, I feel like you have to take advantage of them. Yeah, and yeah, like Ellen Nelson, the Walsh sisters, and Amy Canny, like <clears throat> it's it's really, really hard to replace any of those swimmers. Yeah, like if they want to do it, this year's the year. Agreed. They're not going to get to do it next year. Yeah. So I think they will, but <clears throat> we'll, time will tell. All right. Tell. So those were our nc2a previews for the 2024 women's nc2as we'll have full coverage on swim swam as always so just head over there mm-hmm. during the meet which starts tomorrow night i'm assuming it is at 6 p.m eastern maybe it's 5 p.m eastern i hope that's the case but on to our next big swim meet i'm going? not going to women's nc2as this year i will be covering the meet from right here in austin texas <clears throat> So expect some video commentary from me coming your way. Moving on to across the pond, we saw the New South Wales Championships happen over the weekend. Uh, And first and foremost, Kayla McEwen had herself a meet. She was, let's just, let's just go down the quick list. 2042 in the 200 back, 5757 in the 100 back. 156.0 156.0 in the 200 free, 2088 in the 200 IM, and 27.2 in the 50 back. Those three, those last three events were swum all in the same session on the last day of the meet. Uh, what do you what do you think of this performance by Kaylee, especially coming the week after Reagan Smith had a, a very fire meet in Westmont? I mean, I think this is deja vu to this is deja vu to last year when the two swimmers were back and forth, back and forth, especially in the hundred back. And it just made for very highly anticipated showdowns between them. And yes, their, their rivalry has gotten a little bit one-sided with Kaylee McEwen winning almost all the time, but they're, they're still very close together in terms of time. And it's just been very exciting. And I've honestly come to expect this from Kaylee McEwen just because it has been, her thing to swim really fast and same with reagan smith to swim really fast at these meets i think last year at the new south wales championship she broke the world record in the 200 back so th- this is just not 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 really surprising to me that that once 56 0 does stand out now because this means she can feasibly split 155 on the 800 free relay so definitely a conversation to be had if australia needs it yeah I mean, even if I, I feel like to add to your Olympic medal title in any capacity is is a really big deal. And I'm wondering if we'll see her in the 200 IM at the tail end of the meet. Um, but certainly the 800 free relay is now also another consideration for Miss McEwen. But it's it's such a treat to have fast swimming like this. I mean, this feels Ledecky-esque 
um, because Kaylee McEwen has been so consistent in season and at big championship meets, just delivering over and over again, world-class performances. But then we have this rivalry, this, this cross continental rivalry um, with her and Reagan, which is, I mean, it's not like it's heated, but for them to go back and forth like that and to, th- to throw times at each other where Reagan was slightly faster than the 200 back, uh, Kaylee was slightly faster than the 100 back, they're breaking records left and right. I mean, it's, it's just so exciting. And it's so cool that we have two athletes of that caliber who are swimming similar events and who are both going so fast in those events. Um, we've, we've got a sink or swim later for, that we're going to talk about um, their showdown at the Olympics. But it, it, it has been one-sided, like you said, at international meets. But I think people forget like how close it has been. Um, especially since yeah. Reagan has made the move to ASU. So that that was certainly the highlight uh, for the for the NSW champs. But we saw a lot of a lot of other swimmers show out. Who was your personal highlight outside of Kaylee McEwen? I've got to mention Matt Wilson, who went two oh nine eight in the two hundred breast. I feel like he's been forgotten about a little bit because he didn't make worlds last year, made worlds in 2022, but didn't didn't swim great. But this is this is a really good time for him. I think it's his first time breaking two two ten since the Olympics. So for him to have this swim really close to the Olympics is is pr- pretty good progress and a pretty good way to maybe like finish off the back end of his career. I don't know when he's going to be done with swimming or not, but definitely a, a good reason to keep on going because it feels like he faded out of the spotlight, but now he's kind of back. I don't think he's going to reach the level that he did when he broke the world record in the 200 back, but it's definitely 200 breast, but it's definitely great to see him going internationally competitive times again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was, it was cool seeing, both him and Daniel Roy kind of make these comebacks and swim 209s in the tuner breast this past weekend. But yeah, Matt Wilson specifically goes from 2066, ties the world record in the tuner breast in 2019, uh, to just, yeah, kind of we never saw him reach that level again. It seemed like he was just kind of totally out of it the last couple of years, like you mentioned, since Tokyo. And then now he he throws mm-hmm. down a very solid 209, double O in the 100 breast too. <laughs> it's funny to me that the 200 breast has gotten so much faster in the past five years, but like what is fast in season hasn't necessarily gotten that much faster. Like I feel like people have been going 209 mm-hmm. in season for like the last decade. Mm-hmm. And like that's still, yeah. I'm not saying it's slow or it, it, like it's really fast, but like, that has it. I don't feel like that's gotten too much faster. Like, yeah, but I also think the standard for fast in season times is a little different and is a little more wide, wide. It's it's in a wider range than fast times at an international meet because it's because everyone has different standards of being fast in season and for like for example, if Katie Ledecky went. 819 in the 800 free in season people would say that's slow but that's pretty fast for anyone else so because it's more variable i can see why 209 has been considered fast in season for years whereas it's not really fast internationally that's that is fair yeah once you get to the big meet everyone's in the same spot they're trying to go as fast as they can Mm -hmm. in season Mm -hmm. uh and that's that was kind of the storyline or the lens i was trying to look at this meet specifically through um, because outside of Matt Wilson, there were a lot of really good swims. Um, Molly O'Callaghan, 52 in the 100 free, 154 in the 200 free. Um, and then athletes like Kyle Chalmers, 48.5 in the 100 free, but getting second uh, to William Yang, who was 48.3. Um, Aaron Titmus was 817 in the 800, 402 in the four, and 155 in the two. So you, you, you had a lot of Australia's best throwing down really good solid in season times. And it makes me wonder very similar to a pro swim 
Like, is this where they wanted to be? Is this not where they wanted to be? Like, were they, were some of them disappointed with these swims or were a lot of them just like, yeah, it's March. This is, this is good. Um, it, it just hurts me because I'm usually at these meets interviewing the athletes and able to get this perspective or their perspective on the swims. And so overall, it seems like a lot of Australia's finest are in a pretty good spot. Yeah. Is Molly O'Callaghan the first to break 53 this year? Outside, of I think outside of worlds, I would have to say yes, because I don't think anyone <laughs> goes 52 in the 100 free aside from Australians <laughs> in season. Yeah, and I think the 100 free is supposed to be really competitive this year. And I think that's a big statement from her to be like, I did this. <laughs> what about you guys? What do you have? I did this unrested, unshaved, untapered. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think she's going to have a rock in Olympics. I, I am really curious about if she will pick a third event, you know, if she'll opt to maybe swim the hundred back or the 50 free at Aussie trials and, and see if that is a fit for her heading into Paris, because we know she, that she's a 5,800 backstroker. We know she's a 24. I don't, I actually don't know. She might be a 23, 50 freestyle. I don't, know. I, I don't think she is, but you know, it's like, she has this really solid mid distance range and then she can branch out, but I'm curious if she'll opt to for Paris or just kind of stick to her bread and butter events. Well, I could see her swimming the backstroke events at trials anyways, and just not swim them at the Olympics because yeah. she's done that with worlds for the past two years, but I don't think she'll add any events to her lineup because if there was a year to do that, it was last year, the year before I don't see her changing up her event schedule for the Olympics, because that's really the time where you focus on winning. So, yeah, yeah, it's a fair point. If Australia wins three medals in all the women's relays, that's that's a solid five medals for Molly. Throw in the mixed relay if they she you know if she gets put on that six medals, not a bad haul. Um, one multi-time Olympic medalist from Australia who who swam at the NSW meet was Emma McKeon and she was not on top of the podium. Um, but, but she did seem to swim solid times to me. This is a little bit concerning, but again, it's hard because I don't really know what Emma's thinking or where she's at. And she is getting older, you know, she's definitely in her late twenties, if not maybe 30, um, 29. So, you know, yeah. like, to me, that's a little bit concerning just because even as an older athlete, you want to be trending up, but maybe she is trending up from where she was a few months ago. Yeah. And I mean, her story of peaking and being the best swimmer, the best female swimmer in Tokyo at the age of 27 is already really impressive. So there's got to come a time where she's not trending up anymore. And oh, she's, she's still the decent. 50 yeah, unless you're Sarah Simpson. Um, she still did decently. She she went 53 7 the 100 free, 57 3 in the 100 fly, won the 100 fly. So I don't really think there's any cause for concern here. I don't think many people expected her to be at the level she was at in Tokyo. And Australia will be fine. Okay, maybe not in the medley relay, but everywhere else they'll be fine, even if she's not at the top of her game. Yeah. I mean, if she's 57, three in the hundred fly now, she can be 56, three on a relay. Mm -hmm. I think, I hope. And like, yeah. that's probably still good enough for Australia. I would think. Yeah. And barring, uh, I don't know what even to call it from the U S I think the U S is probably easily winning the medley relay at the Olympics. We can get it. We can get into those yeah. mathematics on another podcast. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I, I did want to do a quick segment about the Japanese Olympic trials that are happening currently as we speak. We're three days into the trials. Uh, a lot of Japanese legends missing the team, although missing is in quotations, but we've seen some really interesting narratives. Um, Yui Ohashi, the defending Olympic champion, the 2IM and the 4IM, missed qualification altogether in the 400 IM. Um, 
uh, I'm sorry, Ryusuke Irie, uh, missed the hundred back qualification in the hundred back tonight. Diaseto missed qualification in the 400 IM. Um, <laughs> and then we, you know, we've had some qualifications as well, but th the Japanese qualifying times are very stiff. Um, and I think that's a big part of this narrative. Um, Yin Yin, your thoughts on on trials three days in? Um, well, the Yu Yu Hashi and Diaseto storylines don't really surprise me because both swimmers seem to be on the downward half of their career. Um, but yeah, like what you said, a lot of these qualifying times don't matter when when the Olympic team is probably going to be heavily influenced by selection selectors discretion. Um, but there are some good storylines. I saw this morning, Satomi Suzuki went a personal best and she's 33 year old is probably going to go to the, has qualified for the Olympics. 105.9. And she, yeah, yeah Riona Aoki, who's been one of the top breaststrokers these past two years. And I remember hearing Suzuki's name, for the first time at Worlds last year when she won, I believe, a semifinal. And mm -hmm. honestly, just just great for her. So that that's the biggest thing that stood out to me. Um, also, 23-year-old Rikako Iki making the oh, yeah. Olympic team yeah. in the 100 fly. Um, she, you know, she obviously uh, had a battle with leukemia. Um, and she's five years removed from that now. And now she'll get to go to the Olympic Games in Paris, uh, which is super cool uh, for Rikako. I, she was a huge player on the international stage before the, the the leukemia diagnosis, and hopefully she, you know, can can go to Paris and have some success, whatever that means for her at this time. Cool. All right, that is our news for the week. So let's end this with some fun on sink or swim. <laughs> Returning to the Reagan Smith Kaylee McEwen rivalry, first up today on Sink or Swim, I am curious if you think that Reagan and Kaylee will go one and one on Olympic gold medals in the backstroke events in Paris. I'm going to sink it. I'm sticking to my original prediction from a few months ago. I remember when we talked about this on the podcast. And you guys both said that Reagan Smith would beat Kayla McEwen. You guys, as in you and Braden, you guys both thought flame for it. I'm sticking with my original prediction that Kayla McEwen will sweep the backstrokes because that's just what she's done. She's faster than Reagan Smith in season and during big meets. And I'm going to continue thinking that she will win unless I'm proven otherwise. Well, I'm going to be the trendsetter. <clears throat> Well, actually, I think gold medal Mel was, but I'm going one and one. I think Reagan has been simmering for she went to an Olympic Games, had all this hype, didn't perform up to expectations. And then she's just been sitting with that for three years. And I think this is her chance to get on top and prove what she's done with Bob Bowman, prove what she is capable of. I, I don't think she's going to like kick Kaylee McEwen's butt in both events, but for right now I'm saying one and one because again, they are so close in, in both events. Yeah, but there's a difference. What's the difference between sitting on it for three years and sitting on it for two years. She was sitting on this last year. She was sitting on this the year before nothing happened. Well, the difference is a, she has one more year yeah. with Bob Bowman yeah. and B it's the Olympics. That's think, true. That's true. You I, I do. I do think it's it. Yeah, it, it yeah. is different. I see your point, but I, I think it's different. Yeah, definitely. The fact that it's an Olympic year adds to the unpredictability. You're not going to get the same results that you, you got in the cycle earlier in the cycle, but I, I'm sticking with my original prediction until I see Reagan <laughs> Smith go at least go a best time in the backstrokes because she hasn't done that yet. Fair enough. Next up on sink or swim. The Olympic committee released, or sorry, NBC released the minute by minute breakdown for each Olympic 
final session. <clears throat> and we can now see that the 200 breast final is just 13 minutes. Sorry for the men's. So let me let me start that over. The two men's 200 breast semifinal is 13 minutes before the four by 200 free relay for the men at the Paris Olympics. Do you think Leon Marchand swims both? I think this reasoning is a double-edged sword, and it's that I don't know what France has to gain or lose from this really because they're not they're not in a position to medal, I don't believe. They're not maybe a bronze Hold on. Let's pause. Uh to give you some context. Um at Worlds, they finished 12th in the 400 free relay, so in prelims. Uh, they finished, and then they finished fourth in both the 800 free relay and the medley relay. Oh, God, I forgot about that. Um, but they and were Leon also, split 144. They were, the, Leon split 144, and they were still over a second, nearly two seconds behind Australia, who that got bronze. Okay. And this is without the Leon Marchand 13 minute gap between two events situation. This was when he was fresh, I believe, or at least mm -hmm. didn't have an event that more, was more fresh. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think, I mean, they, they, they definitely have an outside shot at meddling, but I think there are teams with bigger outside shots than them, in my opinion, like South Korea. Um, because Huang, because South Korea went seven oh four, seven four oh four oh seven when Huang Sung Wu had went one forty six. Huang Sung Wu is capable of going one forty four, and that would make the relay two seconds faster and put them in contention with Australia. I don't think France has that potential. So it's like, is it worth it for Leon to expend extra energy into this relay where their chances of meddling, in my opinion, are pretty slim? Or is it just going to be like, a, oh, there's low risk, low, re low reward. I'm just going to do it anyways. And get us. Sorry, of you're sinking it. Yeah, I'm sinking it. Well, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to sink it too. I don't think he'll do both, but I don't know which one he will do because I think they asked him to. They asked to change the schedule so he could swim the two hundred breast. He's definitely swimming the two hundred breast. You think he'll do two two breast and two fly? Yes. That's a really hard double coming before the two hundred IM. I mean, I, they asked to change the schedule. That doesn't mean he's married to it. Like, it doesn't mean he has to do it. But I just don't see why you would put yourself through all that just to not do what you asked. Put, I don't, I don't think Leon did anything. I think Bob Bowman was just oh, like, yeah, hey, like, guys, why would, you why would your coach put himself through all that? Just, uh, because to, to give you a better chance at, at succeeding if that's the path you take, but I don't think that means it's the path he has to take because the reality is France could, 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 could put more of an emphasis on relays. I mean, getting two fourth places, like I think getting a relay medal of any color is a really big deal. Oh yeah. Especially at a home Olympics. Right. And so it's like, if they have a chance to win a bronze medal in the eight free, or the medley, I like, I think they will go for it. And I think they'll go all in for it. And so I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm thinking that I don't think he'll do the 200 breast and then 13 minutes later do the 800 free relay. But I don't, I don't know which one he will do. Like, I think it's very plausible that he won't do the 200 breast because the, because the two fly two breast like swimming, six 200s in three days is so many yeah it's not ideal but also it'd be kind of funny if he didn't do it after we it had would be. this course over <clears throat> the bob bowman schedule gate 
Well, and I mean, if you think about it, like we had the discourse, they probably didn't even do that much. Like Bob Bowman probably just like sent an email and was like, hey, guys, what do you think about this? And then they were like, OK, and it's, I'm sure it's way more complicated than that. But like it probably didn't take that much effort. We just made a big deal out of it is my hypothesis. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking that he does that double or potential triple three two hundreds in one session. I don't care who you are. That's so much. And like in the smack dab middle of his meet, <laughs> like he still has a lot of comp competition after that. That would be really hard. Yeah. All right. Next up, <laughs> USA Swimming revealed the medals that they will be handing out to first, second, and third place finishers at the 2024 Olympic trials. And let me remind you that the top two athletes in each event in theoretically qualify for the Olympic team. I, the, the gold and silver medals had a silhouette of the Eiffel tower engraved in them signifying you know that you've made the 2024 olympic team headed for paris and then the bronze medal just was normal uh, so the sink or swim here is do you think they should have bronze medals at olympic trials i'm thinking it because i think that's kind of cruel sure, yeah i know in tokyo for tokyo they only did a medal ceremony honoring the top two and honest and i think I'm not even the top two. They only did. They only honored the winner, and then once it was announced that um, this a lot of the second place finishers had made the Olympic team because there were enough doubles, then they like honored all the second place finishers at once. Right. Yeah, I just don't. I just don't understand why you do that at nationals. Last year, they did a medal ceremony with the first, second, and third place finishers, but that's different because, one, there were other meets that you could qualify for, and, two, a lot of the events that third place finisher did, the second place finisher wasn't even guaranteed to make the team, like, in the 50 strokes. But at Olympic trials, it's a very obvious first and second for all the events except for the 100 and 200 free. <clears throat> that's just really awkward, and I don't know why well, and I, I don't know, I don't think they'll have a medal ceremony for the first, second, and third place finishers at trials. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they'll bring the third place finisher out and present them with their bronze medal. But, like, at a lot of national meets, you get a, a trophy or a medal or something if you're, like, in the final, right? If you're top yeah. eight. Yeah, like, the fact that they I'm do fine to, with that. Yeah, the but, fact that they only do it to the third place finisher. Yeah, I agree. That's cool. Yeah, like if that's the case, well, if that's the case and they're only giving a medal to the third place finisher, I don't know. Like it just feels weird to me, especially when they like present it like, oh, here is the gold, silver, bronze medals, but one of these is absolutely unnoticeably not like the others. <laughs> You know, you know, it's like, it's like it feels it's a weird vibe yep. to me. All right. Last up on sink or swim circling back for a third time to Reagan Smith. This was actually quite big news that she entered the NC2A transfer portal, um, meaning that she is eligible to talk to coaches about joining a college swim team. She's obviously training at Arizona State under Bob Bowman, who is the head coach, of the Arizona State men's and women's diving team. Uh, do you think that Reagan Smith will re-enter the NC2A? I am swimming it because she already has the do not contact, which means she knows where she's going to go. And it wouldn't, I would be very shocked to see if she doesn't pick ASU just because she already left college to be at ASU. She's been doing well under Bob Bowman. I don't see why she would change things up just to, I don't know, do NCA swimming. So it, it just makes the most sense for me to, for her to swim with the ASU woman. And that would be a big help to the ASU woman. Do you know off the top of your head when she would have to make this decision by? Um, I don't know. I think like the start 
the start of the season next season. Yeah, because I I'm in my mind, this is dependent on how this summer goes. And I think if she has a great summer, then, you know, it's like, oh, college season. Like, this seems like a fun way to maybe come off of an Olympic year. And I don't know, maybe it's not dependent, but I'm I'm going to swim it as well. Because I think she's obviously doing well at ASU. She seems to be enjoying the team. I mean, and this will be Reagan's second Olympics. This could be a huge Olympics for her. There's also a very real chance that this could be like her last big Olympics. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like, like this is her golden window. It's her golden window. You're never guaranteed another opportunity like this. And she is obviously in her prime. So and college swimming is one of the <clears throat> most agreed upon fun parts about the sport. Yeah. Right. So it's like, why not come off your Olympic push and be part of a team, be part of something bigger than yourself, swim yards. Everyone in the world loves yard swimming. That's a fact. You can't deny it. So I, I think, I think it makes sense from that perspective. And yeah, I, th- I think she'll go for it. She'll be the female Grant House. (laughs) (laughs) She'll be 27 and in her junior year. Yeah. All right. Well, that is our show. Thanks for tuning into the Swim Swam Breakdown. We will see you next time. Bye.